Good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium. Uh, also, please, uh, if you could, uh, fill out the program evaluations. And uh, um, we are always appreciative of any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Jay Swanson. Uh, Dr. Swanson is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. He's been a, a member of the OBGYN department at McFarland and MGMC since uh, I think 2009. Yep, 2009. And, and he uh, has uh, braved the inclement weather today to provide us with an update on contraceptive options. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Swanson. Thank you, Dr. Halberg. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I spent all morning in the OR, so I really didn't brave the inclement weather. But if I do have a line across my, my, my nose here, that's just from an OR mask, and I apologize if I look like a raccoon or something. Um, today we're going to talk about contraceptive options, birth control, and the potential side effects. Um, an email came to me last fall asking if we'd be willing to present on this topic, so I didn't pick the topic. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain this because this is something a gynecologist does every day. But I thought I'd try and give you at least a nice review because there isn't really anything earth-shattering, but we'll go over all the potential options for birth control. And a little bit about me. I, I grew up here. This is my hometown. I uh, went to Fellows and Welch Junior High and Ames High. Didn't go far for college, went to Iowa State. Didn't go very far for medical school, went to Des Moines. But then uh, I did have an Air Force scholarship to pay for medical school, so the Air Force sent me to David Grant, the largest or second largest Air Force hospital on the West Coast, so went to California. And then I got to live in Germany for a couple of years, and then I concluded my Air Force career right down the road in St. Louis. And uh, I have no financial disclosures, and I'm not going to benefit or profit from any of the products mentioned, although I wish I did, but I won't. Um, the topic today will cover uh, the knowledge base of all the contraceptive options available. We're going to go over the risk, benefits, and side effects. Side effects is one of the things in the email, so I suppose you guys want to know all about the side effects. And we're going to go over when to use and when not to use each birth control method. Uh, so I thought you always had to start off with a joke, so I got a couple jokes. Uh, you can pick whichever one you like the best. I personally think the top one with bunk beds is pretty good. Any, any laughter? Not really? All right. Uh, moving on, I, I came up with a pretest to kind of see because I felt some people from my department are coming, so I wanted to at least challenge them. Uh, for everyone else, I kind of wanted to see where your knowledge base was and see what we needed to review and see what we came up with. So here's the first question, and hopefully it's not too challenging, but we'll see. Uh, which birth control method is most often used in the United States? And so we got one, the pill, two, the depo shot, three, the implant, four, the IUD, and five, no method. And you all have little clickers, so if you can just click now, we'll see what everybody thinks. You probably didn't know it was going to be interactive. All right. So we got 51% thinking the pill is most often used, 47% thinking no method, and 2% thinking the IUD. And the correct answer is the birth control pill. So that edged out no method, but it was close. Question two, what is the rate of unattended pregnancies per year in the United States? 13, 28, 36, 45, or 61 percent? And we got a strong front contender at 28%, and then 36, and then 45, and then 61, or sorry, 13, and then 61. So this maybe was a trick question, but we're going to go over this in a minute here. But uh, the actual rate of unintended pregnancies per up-to-date and per the CDC, 45%. Uh, off a different website, I got the different answer of about 49% were unattended, and then 20% are unwanted, and 30% are... Uh, mistimed. So that's the, the rate. So much higher than you might think. So that's kind of why birth control is important. 
All right, question three. What do you need to obtain from a patient before prescribing any method of birth control? So just their history, history in a blood pressure, uh, medical history, blood pressure, pelvic exam, pap testing, STD testing, or all the above plus a hemoglobin. We'll see what people think for this one. What do you need to get out of a patient before you can prescribe them something? I'll say this is per ACOG. So this is per the American College, not per me. Maybe not what I would say is ideal, but... Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four. So ever, as the question, as the answer got longer, people chose that one more. Uh, ACOG would say, all you really need is just a medical history before you can prescribe any method. I would say that there are some methods that you might want to get more detailed, but ACOG says all you have to do is get a medical history and then you can prescribe a method of birth control. All right, true or false, Depo-Provera injections should not be given to teens for a long period of time due to the risk of osteoporosis. So here you go, 50-50 shot. So they even threw one in there for the pediatricians, although I think they usually like us to prescribe birth control to teenagers. And this is per ACOG as well, the American College of OBGYN. All So 53% say true, 47% say false. ACOG says false. With the high satisfaction rate, they recommend long-acting reversible forms of birth control, and they say that the healthcare provider's concerns about long-acting birth control by adolescents are a barrier to access. So ACOG has a big push to try and get longer-acting forms to teens. So it is reversible when they go off birth control, so, or when they go off depo, so it's, they say it's a good thing. All right, question four, which method of emergency contraception is most effective? I threw on a new one, Ella, maybe, maybe to throw you off. I threw another one out there. This is over-the-counter, plan B, levogestrel, or three, the copper IUD, the Paragard. So we'll see emergency birth control most effective. Plan B, most people chose that, is most popular. However, the Paragard does have the highest 0.1% pregnancy rate, so the, the IUD beats all the others. All right, and a patient would like an IUD, so the contraindications would be, and I realize that mainly my department prescribes IUDs, but we'll see what people think for what might be contraindications for placing an IUD. So nulopara, never been pregnant, not currently pregnant, prior history of an ectopic pregnancy, prior history of chlamydia or unexpected vaginal bleeding. So which patient should not get an IUD? I know, they're getting a little harder. I'm trying to challenge my... There's only one right answer. And everyone got this one right. Unexplained vaginal bleeding, the only contraindication on there. And an ongoing, uh, an ongoing pelvic infection. Okay, so next I'm just trying to figure out who the audience is, trying to know the audience. This is anonymous, so I won't know who you, who you are. But I'm just curious if we have more physicians, nurses, medical staff, administrators, just here for the CME hours, or just here for the free lunch. All right, I was hoping everyone was just here for the free lunch, but all right, a lot of physicians, a lot of nurses, a lot of medical staff. All right, next, preferred method of birth control, whether you prescribed it or whether you used it or whether you know about it, or I just wanted to see what everybody thought from the audience would be. The me mo method of birth control most often used or prescribed. And again, it's anonymous unless your neighbor's cheating and looking at your clicker. A lot of pills, a lot of IUDs, some tubules. And actually, we'll come back to this, but this is pretty close to the actual breakdown in the US. And then, doctor discusses birth control at office visits. 
whether you do it or whether you have had it happen when you're at a doctor's visit. Oh, good. All right. So next, I thought I'd ask Ross to help, him, uh, help us with the importance of birth control. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm just, I don't know. I don't understand <laughs> um, how this happened. <laughs> we, we used a condom. I know. I know, but, you know, condoms only work like 97% of the time. What? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, they should put that on the box. They do. No, they don't. <laughs> well, they should put it in huge black letters. <laughs> Okay, Russ, come on, let's just forget about the condom. Oh, well, I may as well have. <laughs> Listen, you know what? I was really freaked out, too, when freaked I found out. Hey, no, I'm not freaked out. <laughs> it goes to show that not only do you need to tell your patients about it, but hopefully they understand how to use birth control. But I thought that was a funny one. All right, so the importance of birth control. Uh, most women spend about 35 years of their life in the reproductive age, uh, 15, or 15 to 50. Uh, most women try to avoid pregnancy during some time of this period. Uh, approximately 30% of pregnancies are unplanned, and 14% are uh, unwanted. And successful family planning has uh, positive impacts both on women, couples, families, society. And so here's kind of what uh, I was able to find online is kind of closer to what UpToDate says currently. 43% um, are intended. About another 20% are just mistimed where they're happy nonetheless. And we usually ask this at their new OB appointment. Did you try? Well, yes. Are you happy? Yes. Well, we hope they're not in this category. Unwanted that just they're not happy about it. And maybe some of these could be um, still happy nonetheless, or maybe it could go to an adoption. Uh, this is kind of what we're hoping not to, but 29% unwanted, mistimed, might end in an abortion. Uh, I got this off the CDC website, and I just want to make everyone laugh for a second. They said that we're making progress. We've decreased it by 18% from 54 all the way down to 45. Doesn't quite look like 18 to me. But the importance of this one here, um, the largest declines are in teens. Um, sorry. In teenagers, 15 to 19, three out of every four pregnancies are unintended. So teens are really maybe the focus group of who we want to try and reduce unintended pregnancies with, since they're really not trying, but maybe. Um, and then next I thought I'd go over all the different birth control options, and there's kind of a, a list here, uh, kind of visual too. We have a condom, which is a male form, the female condom, the birth control pill, the hormonal ring, the IUD, the injection for birth control, sterilization, the implant, withdrawal or coitus interruptus, the rhythm method or natural family planning, uh, spermicides, the contraceptive patch, and then the diaphragm. And since Valentine's Day is coming up, I kind of like how Planned Parenthood came up with this slogan, you know, in it for the long run, that's the IUD. Uh, forget me not, that's your birth control pill. I'll keep you safe, we've got the condom, let's stick together, ha ha, the patch. Glad you put a ring on it. I, I think they got a good shot at it. Yeah, kind of your Valentine's Day. All right, so some birth control methods work some better than others, and this graph kind of helps you figure out uh, which ones work better than others. The longer acting ones are up at the top. They work a lot better than the shorter acting ones. They work not so good. And then the not so well are kind of the not so long acting ones. So you can kind of help think about effectiveness is related to duration. So the most effective ones are obviously good for the longest. The n medium are the mediums and the not so good are the ones that aren't really you know used as, as long. So duration and effectiveness goes hand in hand. So longer duration, more effective. Okay, so then I thought I'd break down uh, which ones are the more popular ones so that you can kind of see how this goes. And here's contraceptive use throughout the world. So 
36% use no form of birth control, and that's kind of what a lot of people thought at the start, where not everybody uses birth control. 19% uh, tubal sterilization, 13% use an IUD, 8% use the pill, the condom, the injection, rhythm. Uh, the worldwide, I think we need more urologists because vasectomies seem really low. So I don't know if we need a bigger push for worldwide. And then we got all the small ones out here. And then if you break that down, the U.S. has a little bit different demographic where the pill actually is the more common one. And female sterilization comes second. Again, I don't know, we need more vasectomy, so maybe we need to send more patients to urology, so make a note, more people to urology. Uh, condom, male condom, 15. The long-acting reversible ones, this is where ACOG is really pushing. And then you got some of the shorter ones, and that's worldwide. And then I found this fund, so I just thought I'd throw it in there. It comes from the WHO, broken down by continent. So you can see how developed countries or more developed countries have different rates than others where, you know, the pills are more, more common in some of these, maybe not so common in Asia. Uh, the IED is very common in Asia. Africa, no birth control method is very common. Or their, their birth control is actually not so much. Uh, I assume the WHO meant this is Antarctica, Oceania. Anyway, it's just kind of fun to see how they're distributed throughout the world. All right, so breaking it down, I thought we'd start with combined contra or with hormonal contraceptives because uh, that's usually what we end up prescribing. And when, when it comes to hormonal contraceptions, there's really two main types. So I tell patients there's combined contraception, and this is where we have estrogen and progesterone together, and that's your pill, that's your patch, your ring. And then there's the progesterone-only methods, and there's still a pill, there's a shot, there's an implant, there's an IUD. And so starting with the birth control pill, since it's the most common form of birth control in the U.S., um, has an effective rate of about 8% with typical use. It's pretty easy. Patients like it because they just take a pill. And it also has a very quick return to fertility. We sometimes use this to try and time the cycle if they know their husband's coming back. Well, just take the pill until about two weeks before he comes back. It can be used in uh, extended fashion to skip cycles for those patients with pelvic pain. You can just have them take it... Um, some of the marketing has gone into this where seasonal, seasonique, oh, sorry, seasonal, seasonique, four seasons, haha, -ha, season, take one every season. Or labrel, you can just take a pill and have a, have, not have a cycle all year long. And FYI, first birth control pill came out in 1960. All right, so how do these work? Well, it's a combination of estrogen and progesterone together, and these are basically the hormones that the ovary is making. So I tell patients that it's kind of like feeding back on the brain, and that is how it works. It helps prevent uh, gonadotropin stimulation, so it prevents LH uh, uh, release, so follicles never luteinize, so it doesn't ovulate. Um, I tell patients that you know the left ovary thinks the right one's doing all the work, and the right one thinks the left one's doing all the work, so they kind of both go on vacation. And that really is how it works. I mean, you're just taking the hormones that they would have made. Um, they do come in monophasic and triphasic options. Uh, monophasic means every pill in the pack is exactly the same. That's really where we kind of focus for those patients who um, might not be as compliant because then if they miss one, they're less likely to have much, as much side effects. Uh, triphasic options, they kind of step up where they go low and then medium and then high, and then they have the period usually in the pill-free week. And so um, if you have a triphasic option and then the hormones are already moving upward and then you miss one, you're more likely to have some side effects. And the birth control pill has many benefits, and I'm not sure everybody knows about all the benefits, which is why I put it first. Um, usually makes periods lighter or usually makes cramping less. Usually they have lighter periods so they have less blood flow, decrease in iron deficient anemia, decrease in ovarian cysts, because if you're suppressing cysts, you're suppressing ovulation, decrease in Decrease in ectopic pregnancies, uh, decrease of fibrocystic breast disease, endometrial cancer, and ovarian cancer. And yeah, they have the results from the WHO trial that shows a fairly significant decrease in ovarian cancer. Um, my wife did give me permission to say this. My mother-in-law had ovarian cancer, and she's never coming off the birth control pill. She's staying on it forever. So, um, Also decreases uterine cancer, um, really has a lot of significant benefits, and so um, I think that a lot of patients don't really know all the benefits. You can also use it to treat PMS, prevents colorectal, endometrial ovarian cancer, obviously makes periods better, makes hirsutism better, uh, used to treat polycystic ovarian syndrome, makes periods stop, used to um, treat endometriosis and chronic pelvic pain. Um, but one of the things I also wanted was side effects. So the side effects, 
Well, weight gain, there's been a lot of trials, and the biggest one ever showed that maybe there was a half pound per year difference. So it's not a significant weight gain, but might be slight. Uh, change in appetite, they might get nauseous, mood swings, sex drive can go up or down, breast tenderness can go up or down, acne should, acne should go down. All birth control pills work the same way as far as how they reduce acne by increasing sex hormone binding globulin, so any birth control pill should be effective against acne, although um, Yaz and orthotricycline are the ones that have FDA indications for it. Um, melasma might occur from it where they get the dar darkening the skin on the face. Some women can have headaches get worse, intermenstrual spotting, nausea. Those are just some of the side effects. Okay, moving on. Maybe. Uh, there are some risks from the birth control pill. Um, the first risk is r increased risk of stroke. These mainly were back on the older formulations when there was much more estrogen in the birth control pill, and so they found an increased risk of stroke. Mainly this is related to women with underlying predisposition uh, predisposing conditions, which mainly would be tobacco use, and that'll be a common trend. You really don't want to use birth control pills in women who smoke, especially as they get older or if they have other factors like obesity, hypertension, or if they have a previous history of a, a DVT. Um, the new lower dose formulations don't really increase these risks in non-smoking healthy women, so low dose pills would be safe uh, even when it comes to the stroke. Uh, there's a slight increased risk of myocardial infarction for those over 35 who do smoke. Smoking and birth control pills work synergistically together to increase this risk. Um, but studies show that past use of birth control pills do not increase your risk of a heart attack. So just because you used it in the past doesn't mean. Uh, breast cancer, several large British and Canadian studies showed no increased risk of breast cancer with current um, birth control pill use. Um, although the results were inconsistent with BRCA positive patients, and they're probably higher risk because they're BRCA positive. Um, and then oral estrogen does increase the risk of triglycerides, so your patients with high cholesterol, you don't want to give them an oral birth control pill. Um, cervical cancer, uh, there were several epidemiologic studies that showed a double the risk of invasive cervical cancer when taking birth control pills for more than five years, although they've gone back and reanalyzed a lot of this data and they found that there was a lot of underlying conditions that increased the risk for cervical cancer. So the increased risk of cervical cancer mainly is this latter part where younger age at first intercourse, younger age at first pregnancy, increasing parity, increasing number of sexual partners, especially more HPV exposure, and duration of birth control use. Uh, not really sure, but maybe it just makes those uh, cells a little more susceptible. And then the other main risk of a birth control pill would be the chance of a blood clot or a venous thromboembolism. There's various reports on this, and um, we'll kind of take the next minute and the next few slides to go over it. Um, birth control pills might increase the risk of blood clots a little bit. Um, pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum all have higher risks. So if you think you're doing your patient a favor by not putting them on a birth control pill, just know that once they're pregnant, the risk is high, and once they deliver, the risk is super high. So here's the FDA warning, or the, the black box, against the risk of uh, blood clots. Um, so birth control pills um, can increase the risk, and they kind of put all these conditions on here. Of course, if they get a blood clot, they're gonna get maybe a stroke, or an MI, or maybe a uh, pulmonary embolism. Um, but here's, here's the risk factors for it. So over the age of 35, smoking, obesity, postpartum, surgery, two weeks after surgery, bed rest, and a personal history of a DVT. So these are kind of all these things that would make you high risk for a DVT anyways, but estrogen just makes it a little higher. Um, and I got this right out of the package. So some of your patients might ask you, doctor, I saw on the TV that there's warnings if I ever took Yasmin before. And this came right out of the Yasmin packaging. So if you're wondering where I got it, this came from it. And I think the main part is the second paragraph right here where it says to put the risk of developing blood clot and a birth control pill into perspective, the risk of blood clot is higher when using any birth control pill than not using them, but it still remains lower than when you're pregnant or in a postpartum. And this is straight off the, uh, off the uh, FDA. So here's what pregnant, or non-pregnant, sorry, non-pregnant normal person has a one to 5% chance per every 10,000 women years of developing a blood clot. Birth control pills, three to nine, so it's just a little higher. Pregnancy, we got five to 20, and then postpartum goes way up. 
Now, it does make a little bit of difference as far as which birth control pill we're talking about. So this is another chart that I got off, offline that kind of puts a little perspective. Two in 10,000 women, this is your baseline. So all these forms of birth control pill, all these forms of birth control do not increase the risk. Uh, these forms of birth control do not increase the risk. So your IUDs and your implants and all that, normal. Um, the first generation pills, that's still a normal risk. Uh, your second generation pills, maybe a little bit. The third generation Nuva ring, that's a little higher up there with the ortho ever patch. Those are just a little higher, mainly because of it's a different progesterone. And then your fourth generation progesterone, a little bit higher yet, but all these are significant lower than pregnancy. So the main take home point I'm gonna try and tell you for this is, if they're over 35 and they smoke and they have hypertension or diabetes, they should not be on some of these forms of birth control. But if they're young, and they're normal, and they don't, they're not overweight, and they don't smoke, then you probably still can get away with giving these types of a pill. And it's a lot more risky if they get pregnant or if they're postpartum. So they're still fairly safe. It's just you got to choose your patients wisely. And when it comes down to it, we really don't want them to get pregnant because then their risk is much higher. All right, so the true contraindications per ACOG would say if they had a previous unexplained VTE, pregnancy-related VTE or estrogen-related VTE. Um, women over the age of 35 and older who smoke tobacco, those are contraindications, and poorly controlled diabetes. Oh, all right, next. The birth control patch, really this is kind of the same medications, just conveniently put in a patch. It's delivered transdermally across the skin. It's pretty convenient. They just use a patch for a whole week, so one patch, two patch, three patches, no patch. Um, the patch can be placed anywhere on the body except on breast tissue. It's about si a little bit bigger than a postage stamp. Um, has very similar rate to a birth control pill as far as failure, uh, 8%. Should use a backup method for the first week if they're not starting close to their menstrual cycle. Um, the transdermal patch does have a little bit of a higher estrogen. Uh, exposure, and so that's why they say that there's a little bit higher risk of blood clots over a pill. Um, all the contraindications to a pill should be the same as to the patch in the ring. So next would be the birth control ring. Uh, it's basically a whole month's worth of birth control pills just conveniently placed in a ring. The ring is placed anywhere inside the vagina, and it's good for the whole month. Or there, the company has told us that there's medication actually for 35 days, so if they were using continuous use, they can just place the ring at the start of the month, place it at the next start of the month, and they can just use it continuously just like you'd use a birth control pill. Um, and then lastly, there is one thing that is new as far as birth control. Um, there's a year-long pill, and I'm not sure if I know how to say this, but we'll go with Anerva. It's a newer estrogen and a, or newer, uh, sorry, newer progesterone and an estrogen, and you only place it once a year. Although I don't know how patients are gonna like that, where they place a, a ring around this, it kind of goes by the cervix is where it goes but they don't have to change it, except for once a year. So that's coming out later this year or 2020. It's just been approved. And then there's the progesterone only pill. Um, this is actually just a progesterone, progesterone method. Um, it's norethindrome, 0.35 milligrams. Uh, every pill in the pack is the same because they need to take it every day. Now it is safer because it doesn't have estrogen, so this is ideal for your patients with even a personal history of stroke, blood clot, heart attack. They can all take this, this one. It's very safe. Uh, its downside is it has a very short half-life, about 28 hours. So you can see with such a short half-life, you miss one, you're gonna be in trouble. So that's why this one, you kinda need to take it every day. Um, the amount of progesterone in it is very similar to other birth, low-dose birth control pills, but key, continuous without a break. Uh, next, progestin-only method would be the depo shot. Um, 150 milligrams of depo progesterone. It's given every three months. Um, has a 3% failure rate with typical use, although if they come in and they get their shot on the third, you know, the every three months, it has a 0.3% failure rate with consistent use. Um, it does have a few side effects where most women who are on the shot, their periods stop, and so that happens about 75% of the time. So I'd tell you those three out of four, they love the shot because they don't have any, any menstrual cycle and they're very happy. Um, it is a little bit of a higher dose of progesterone, so some women can get headaches or nausea. It basically tricks the body into thinking that it's pregnant at such a high progesterone level, so that's kind of how it works. 
Uh, weight gain, uh, some women tell me that they gain more weight on Depo Pereira, and anecdotally, certainly I've seen it over my career. Um, I tell them that it's very similar to pregnancy, so if they gained a lot of weight when they're pregnant, they'll probably gain a lot of weight on the Depo shot. And then a newer one is uh, bone density loss. Uh, some studies have shown that there's a decrease in bone density. However, the key that ACOG is pushing is it's reversible when they go off, and it has not been shown to reduce, or it's not linked to fractures. So apparently full recovery and not linked to fractures. So even though there is a slight decrease, they still say it's fairly safe. Um, has no increased risk on uh, cervical ovarian or breast cancer risk, but certainly decreases endometrial cancer because that high progesterone level is thinning out the endometrium. The subdermal implant, known as the Nexplanon, the previous one on the market was called the Implanon. The difference between Nexplanon and Implanon is this one shows up on x-rays. So that if it's a deep insertion, which the new applicator tried to prevent the IED from being inserted too deep, or if it got lost, now these new ones show up on x-ray. So very convenient if we can't find it. Um, it's a small little rod. It's about two millimeters by four centimeters long, usually placed on the inside of the arm to protect it from the outside of the body. You usually don't have a lot of trauma to that area of the body. Um, it's good for up to three years, has an extremely low failure rate of 0.3%. Return to fertility usually just a couple weeks and you're back to fertile again. Um, does not rely on compliance, but they do need to come back at the end of the three years to have it removed. Um, so that's the compliance point where they need to come back. And some patients even maybe forget a little bit because they're happy that usually periods are a little lighter on this and so they're pretty happy. So most common side effects, uh, changes in bleeding, usually a little lighter periods, sometimes longer, but usually lighter. Um, progesterone methods, this would be applying to most progesterone methods where they cause acne, uh, mood swings, headache, weight gain, depression. Uh, this one's a little different, a little uh, pain at where, it, where it's implanted. Uh, next is the a large population of what we call for progesterone-only contraception, the IUD. Uh, this has levonorgestrel, which is actually a progestin off of a, out of a birth control pill. It's placed inside the uterus, and it uh, makes the cervical mucus thicker. And so it's uh, very good for those um, patients who have troubles remembering to take a pill. Uh, the first one on the market was called the Mirena. Uh, it's good for five years. Uh, 52 milligrams of levogesterol. They came out with a new one for women who have never had a baby before called the Skyla. It's significantly smaller in size, um, has a smaller dose of progesterone at 13 milligrams, but it's only good for three years. And then Bear actually came out with what we, we kind of call the hybrid. It's in between. It's smaller like the, Ky or the Kylina. It's smaller like the Skyla. It's got a little bit more. Oh, that should be a 19. Oops, 19. Uh, 19.5. It's good for five years, and so it's smaller. So the Mirena is bigger, and I don't have the Paragard. The par well, we're coming up to that one. Sorry. The Mirena is bigger in both uh, width and length, and then the, the Skyla and the Kylina are, are both smaller. Um, so yeah, this is another good explanation that shows you um, size, and so the, the little ones are much smaller millimeters than the, the bigger ones. Uh, there is a newer one called Liletta that's on the market. It's kind of the same as the Mirena, same 52 milligrams, but they're only FDA approved for three years, so I'm not sure why someone would want one for same price for two less years. So it's not really had much of a hold in the United States. Um, these IUDs, uh, the, whole, the whole IUD family, second only to sterilization, so it's a very good long-acting form. So those who can't remember this would be a good choice. Uh, then we uh, go to the side effects. Uh, cramping mainly is what's being placed. A lot of women have their period stop. Ovarian cysts, this is usually for the first month or two. Having it fall out, this has only happened to me once in my career. Ectopic pregnancy, it's kind of a trick question because their chances of pregnancy are so low, but if they do get pregnant with an IUD in place, then the risk of ectopic is higher. So it's kind of a trick question. They usually ask it on boards. Um, Entry in pregnancy, that would be kind of a low side effect. Pelvic inflammatory disease, the IUD does not cause that. Gonorrhea committee are bad. Perforation of the uterine wall, this occasionally happens, but it's pretty low as far as the number of IUDs we place and having it not in the right spot. Uh, there's a non-hormonal IUD. This is called the Paragard. It basically uses copper to make an acidic environment inside the uterus. It's still highly effective, convenient, good for 10 years. This one can also be used for emergency contraception. That acidic environment basically interferes with sperm movement. 
Uh, rapid return to fertility as soon as it's taken out. Um, early concerns about infection and infertility over the years in the studies have shown no increased risk. Uh, sterilization, having your tubes tied, should be considered permanent. The biggest risk of sterilization, 25% chance of regret. So that's the biggest risk. Uh, sterilization won't change your menstrual cycle at all. Uh, it, it can be done in several ways. One of the newer ways is to remove the fallopian tubes. Fallopian tube removal would be a decrease in ovarian cancer. Um, also, interestingly, for the uh, uh, CDC and WHO, they usually throw hysterectomy into sterilization. I suppose that's the ultimate form of birth control. Uh, vasectomy, done in the office. Um, important thing to remember about a vasectomy is it does not provide an immediate uh, benefit. And then the barrier methods, uh, we got the condom. The condom is just a male form of birth control. It does reduce sexually transmitted disease transmission. It's fairly inexpensive, uh, can be uh, combined with other birth control methods, and typical failure rate is about 10 to 15 percent a year. Uh, the female condom, a little more expensive than the male condom, just acts as a vaginal liner. Same typical failure rate as a male condom, or maybe a little higher. Uh, should not be used together. That's the main take home point. Don't use a male condom and a female condom due to uh, slipping, and they don't work well together. Uh, the diaphragm is an old-fashioned one. I can say that I've only had one patient in the last many years come in and ask for a diaphragm. Basically, it's a silicone device that covers the cervix, typically used with spermicide. Um, typical failure rate's about 16%. Main side effects are irritation from use, could be related to increased uh, yeast infections and bacterial infections, according to the literature. Uh, the cervical cap, this is like a diaphragm for experts because it's smaller, more harder to place, and it goes just over the cervix. And it has a little higher failure rate. So this is kind of like the advanced diaphragm. And I've never had a patient request one of these. Uh, the sponge, uh, typically it was a little bit like a diaphragm, but impregnated with uh, spermicide placed high in the vagina. Can be inserted 24 hours prior and kept into place for six hours after intercourse. Um, higher pregnancy rates than the diaphragm. Uh, barrier method, spermicide, basically how it works is the spermicide destroys, it's a surfactant, so it destroys the cell membranes, can be placed in the vagina not more than one hour prior, and should be left in place for six to eight hours after, just to kind of make sure to uh, kill all the sperm. Um, typical failure rate, but almost 30%, does not protect against STDs. Uh, emergency contraception needs to, so if they miss using birth control and they call your office, needs to be usually used within 72 hours to decrease preg pregnancy by up to 75%. Um, hormonal emergency contraception does not uh, affect an established pregnancy and really has no harm to an early pregnancy if taken inadvertently. So if your patient's not sure, um, best to tell them to take it as soon as they find out. Uh, earlier is better. Uh, the most common is available over the counter. It's called Plan B, which is basically leave an adjustral or that progestin. They take two tablets, uh, ideally within 72 hours, and they repeat one later, although um, ACOG suggests that it can be taken together as a single dose. And most over-the-counter formulations sold now are one tablet or one single dose. Uh, most effective if within the first three days, and if their menstrual cycle is late by more than a week, it probably didn't work. Uh, also, a Paragard IUD could be placed for emergency contraception when inserted up to seven days after unprotected intercourse, has a less than 1% failure rate. And then also they can just continue that as their method of birth control thereafter. So a little bit of a benefit there. So we kind of raced through most of these, kind of giving you a, hopefully a review of all the different methods. Um, the take home method is higher effectiveness, medium effectiveness, and low effectiveness. So Hopefully, when your patients are talking about it, you're going to steer them clear of these and more likely under these and ideally under those. Um, and then next, I was going to go over uh, contraception in women with medical problems. And I thought we could probably be here all afternoon going through every medical problems where adolescents have uh, certain unique situations. Obesity um, certainly can affect the uh, effectiveness of contraceptions. And then I found an interesting uh, tool that I'm going to teach you all about called the USMEC. So the CDC actually came out with a list called the United States Medical, Elgi Medical Eligibility Criteria for Contraceptive Use, or USMEC. Uh, it's available through the CDC, and so you can go there and, and look this up. And it's actually very helpful. 
So there's four categories, and the first category is kind of like this birth control pill has no restriction, it would be a good idea. The second one is the, the benefits outweigh the risks. The third one are the risks might outweigh the benefits. And the fourth one is don't do it, the risks are higher. And so here's a great one to start with. So here's smoking and contraceptive use. So if you were to go and type this in, you'll, you'll, well, we'll go over how to get there. Um, you'll see the, the different conditions, and it'll go over it. And they've broken it down very in depth. So here we got smoking. So if they're less than 35, pretty much all birth control methods, remember, benefits outweigh risks. So even a birth control pill could be used. Over the age of 35, if it's less than 15 cigarettes a day, maybe you don't want to. If it's more than 15 cigarettes a day, you definitely don't want to. And they've updated it even um, with new conditions, and so this kind of gives you an example of what the 2016 updates were. And I'm kind of running low on time, so I'll skip past it um, just to speed things up. So here's scenario one of a 28-year-old uh, counseled for postpartum family planning. She's not planning on breastfeeding. What options are available? And so we got an IUD, the progesterone-only method, and then the hormonal method. I don't know if I have time to go through all the clicking. So the clickers, but um, what happened here? Okay, why it's important. Do we want to avoid a short birth interval? So postpartum women, we try to make sure they don't get pregnant until they're ready to. Um, ideal time to talk about birth control at postpartum visits, and we want to prevent repeat adolescent pregnancies. So here it broke it down to, here's your postpartum patient. And it looks at birth control pills. So not so good for the first 21 days. 21 to 42 days with other risk factors for a blood clot, not so good. Without other risk factors for a blood clot, yeah, you maybe could give her a uh, birth control pill since she's not breastfeeding. And greater than 42 days, you can use a birth control pill or any progesterone method. Uh, postpartum IUD insertion, yeah, they broke it down to less than 10 minutes after delivery of the placenta to 10, to 10 minutes to four weeks, greater than four weeks. and Obviously, you wouldn't want to put an IUD in anyone who is septic, but um, otherwise, you can see the IUDs, uh, progesterone or copper, are good for postpartum women. All right. So uh, basically, all those are good, except for you might want to wait, depending on your risk factors, for the last one. All right, so if she has diabetes and she's using condoms for birth control, she wants a more effective method, she comes into you. Uh, you can look up diabetes on the US MEC, and you can see that um, copper IUDs, progesterone IUDs, they're good. Implants, depo, they're good. Uh, birth control pills, not so good if they have neuropathy, retinopathy, vascular disease. So you can actually just look up the, the form of diabetes and kind of figure out where she's at to know if you should uh, and what and what birth control options maybe are, are best for her. All right. And if she has a history of migraine headaches, and the key to this one was without, she doesn't, where she meet, uh, she does not experience any aura, so that was the key to this one. So you go on to US MEC, and you see that um, with without an aura, pretty much all contraceptive options are good for her. With an aura, you'd try to avoid a birth control pill. So that's a take home that uh, migraines with aura are not good candidates for birth control pills, or for combined birth control pills. They'd still be an option for a um, progesterone-only pill. Uh, a 19-year-old comes in. Basically, this is kind of like my pretest. She had chlamydia just uh, six months ago. Can she get an IUD? Oh, there you go. So if she currently has an ongoing infection, no. If she has a history of an infection, it's OK. Uh, if she currently has vaginitis or other risk factors for an STD, she can still get a, a, an IUD. And it says that when they come in, that you can screen them for gonorrhea or chlamydia and still place their IUD at the same appointment. I'm not so sure I'm aggressive enough to do this. I usually screen first and place it later. But ACOG says you can place it this way. Um, lastly, it also this, this program also tells you about other um, Medication. So if they're on birth control pills and they come in and they ask you, can I start certainly restart my certainly for depression? Uh, yes, you can. So it'll tell you SSRIs with birth control pills or which birth control options are safe. So, sorry, I'm down to like my last three minutes. Um, so basically, they put this together, and you can go online and you, or you can go online, or you can actually get this for your iPhone. 
I probably don't have enough time to try and get it overhead. But there's an app for this. And so you just go there, and you can pick whichever medical uh, condition they have or whichever birth control method they have, and you can go in and find out if anything is safe or unsafe. So you don't have to memorize everything. They've got a very convenient app. And I, I was going through it over the past week. It's very easy to pick diabetes, hypertension. I mean, they got them all on there. And then it shows you broken down by what your patient might have, if they have retinopathy, if they have... Uh, previous vascular disease, and it'll tell you which one is safe to use and which one's not. So the CDC, or the, sorry, yeah, the CDC has done all the work for you, and it's in a convenient app, and it's free. Um, also, if you go in and you pick, they got migraines, has an aura, you can see which ones to use and which ones not to use. So it actually breaks it down for you. So it's a very nice app. Even tells you the evidence behind it. So I figured if I told you about it, you know, if I gave you a fish, you'd eat for today. If I taught you how to fish, you'd eat for the next year. So hopefully try the app. It does work very well. Or you just go to um, CDC and you can um, pull up the birth control and they got a wheel so you can just figure it out online. Um, you can get some CMEs because that's kind of exactly like what we did today because they, they're um, online. It's pretty close. Um, and they got residency training, all those fun things. And that's pretty much all I had for birth control. Uh, anyone have any questions? I know I kind of ran out of time or zipped through towards the end. Sorry. Usually when I'm nervous, I talk fast. I didn't talk fast enough. I ran out of time. Well, thank you all for coming, and stay warm.